may recall a few years ago, there was a story going around to this effect about a little girl who was told by her parents to pray because there had been so many misfortunes and sufferings in the family. And so the little child prayed and said, Dear Lord, my brother has the mumps. Her sister fell off the bicycle and broke her leg. And my older brother has pneumonia. And Daddy lost his job. So, dear God, please take care of yourself because if anything happens to you, we'll all be in the soup. <laughs> We have received so many letters from people who have had uh, greater sufferings than this little girl. We decided tonight to talk on the subject of suffering. First, on some of the paradoxes of suffering. Secondly, on two ways of meeting pain or suffering. And uh, finally, how to accept it. First of all, the paradoxes. Have you noticed that in our contemporary civilization, there happens to be a coincidence. First of all, a great material prosperity and at the same time, a tremendous amount of inner and mental discontent. First of all, we do have material prosperity. The per capita income of the United States is around $1,750. China is $26 a year. But along with that, there's an inner unhappiness. 51% of the hospital beds of the United States are occupied by mental patients. We ought not to have this tragic sense of life with so much prosperity. Why is it? it certainly is not because we're prosperous. It can only be because, to a great extent, we are assuming that all we need to be happy is some external prosperity. In other words, we've made our philosophy a philosophy of having, rather than a philosophy of being. And the reason there is this inner discontent and unhappiness is because man is trying to put the infinite into the finite. This is the mathematical symbol of the infinite. This is the symbol of the finite. And what we're trying to do with our soul and our heart that was made for the infinite of life and truth and love, we are attempting to pull this infinite down into our finite structure with all of its material environment. It simply cannot be done. Rather, what we should do to be happy in the midst of prosperity is to take this finite nature of ours and plunge it into the infinite. As Hans Werfel said, this line of the human and the finite and reason must be crossed somehow or other. And Werfel continuing says, it is crossed above by faith and it is crossed below by insanity. That is the, is the first peculiar paradox of modern suffering. Now there's a, a second. And the second has to do with pleasure. Have you ever noticed that we have a greater capacity for pain than we have for pleasure? For example, we, uh, our pleasures are not always very enduring. For one thing, a pleasure can reach a point where it will give us pain. It can turn into pain. For example, tickling. And then also, have you noticed, too, that pleasure sometimes will go up like this, and then there will be a sudden drop in them. And finally, in order to get identically the same reaction, one must very much increase the stimulus. So we're not getting here, out of this life, all of the pleasure and happiness that we possibly can. But pain... Pain, it seems, could very quickly reach an end, and yet somehow it reaches that end that we anticipated, and we still bear it. We go to a dentist, and we feel that if he drills five minutes more and goes six feet deeper, I just can't stand it. <laughs> we stand it all right, 
And then he continues to bore, and we know he's going to hit oil. We stand here. There are many people listening to me in sick beds of suffering who felt that they should have exhausted themselves months or years ago, but they still can go on suffering. Now, why is this? Why do we have a greater capacity for pain than for pleasure? I think because it was intended by God that all pain here should end. That's why we seem to exhaust it. Because there will come another world when tears will be wiped away. And the sorrows of this life are not worthy to be compared with the joys that are to come. But with pleasure. Pleasure and joy, particularly, is not intended to be exhausted here. That comes elsewhere. That happiness is being saved for heaven. And if people understood that, perhaps they would be, well, less mentally disturbed, less inclined to go to the psychiatrist, because they've all got skeletons in their closet. They make no bones about it. <laughs> that brings us to the double reaction to pain. There are two possible ways of enduring pain. As Stevenson expressed two ways of looking out of prison bars. Two men looked out through prison bars. The one saw mud, the other stars. And in the midst of agony and pain and suffering, one reaction of pain can be rebellion. The other reaction of pain can be resignation. Why this difference? The difference is due to the fact that this person has sees no purpose in pain. And when there's no purpose seen, no final destiny, when pain is just as opaque as a curtain, then it's rather natural for the soul to revolt against it. When one can see a purpose in it, see it as a means, see it transparent, and as opening onto something else, then there can be resignation. These two attitudes toward pain were perfectly exemplified on a day when two thieves and revolutionists were put to death. They were crucified on either side of our divine Lord. Both of these revolutionists suffered exactly the same torture. They had identically the same background. When they each felt the impress of the nail in their hands, when the crucifixion began, they blasphemed. And then when finally they had gone had mounted their crosses. They heard the one on the central cross speak. It was a peculiar word he spoke. Generally when men die, they either protest their innocence, or if they have any spark of justice in their souls, they ask for forgiveness. Here, for the first time in the history of the world, the Son of God on the central cross was saying, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. When the thief on the left heard this cry. He suspected that there on that central cross was power. And so he asked the one on the central cross if he had power to take him down. That to him was the sign of omnipotence to stop that pain and that suffering. Why should he be there? 
Why did he ask to be taken down? Not to be made better, but simply to go on with the dirty business of thieving. But the other thief, when he heard that prayer from the Central Cross, immediately began to see a relationship between his sufferings and his guilt. His background is a blackguard, a revolutionist, and a racketeer. And some sparks from the Central Cross ignited some inflammable material in his soul in the belfry of his conscience, the bell began to toll. And he spoke to the brother thief. And he said, fear ye not. Fear ye not. We suffer the just reward of our crime. This man has done no wrong. Then he uttered a prayer. And turning to the divine Savior on the central cross, he said, Remember me. Remember me. When thou shalt come into thy kingdom. Kingdom? This one who apparently was a fellow criminal. The thief looked at a crown of thorns and saw there a royal diadem. The nail was to him a scepter of power and authority. His crucifixion was his installation and his blood was as royal purple. And he asked Tony to be remembered. And there came back. This day. Thou shalt be with me. In paradise. was the foundation of democracy, the worth of a single soul. Thou shalt be with me. I always wonder why he said in paradise. Be with him is paradise. And the thief died a thief. For he stole paradise. And paradise can be stolen again. And from these two reactions, we see the one that is to be chosen. The two ways in which pain can be used. Pain can be used, first of all, in expiation. That is to say, for our own failings and sins. Secondly, in reparation for the failings and the sins of others. First of all, expiation. I can remember uh, when I was a boy about eight or nine years of age, my brother and I were playing a ball in the backyard, and we threw a ball accidentally through the neighbor's window. And mother heard it, and she called us in. And uh, she sent us to our piggy bank. And she made us take the money out and go over to the man next door and give him the money for the broken window. And also ask, ask him to forgive us. Now, why shouldn't we just ask to be forgiven? Well, because we broke a window. People think that when they do anything wrong, all they have to do is be forgiven. Oh, no, we disturb an equilibrium, an order. And that order often has to be redressed. For example, if I stole your watch, if I stole the watch of one of these operators here, 
if I could get close enough to this cameraman and steal his watch here. Uh, and then I would say to him, I'm awfully sorry, I stole your watch, will you forgive me? He says, yes, I forgive you. But he says, give me back my watch. <laughs> well, so it is if we have, if we have sins, and who in the name of God has them? Well, we can ask the good Lord to take the pains, come to us in expiation, in redress, in atonement, for all the wrong that we have done. We put down our foot, for example, three times in illegitimate, sinful pleasure, and to get back there to do right again, we've got to put our foot down in pain and be like little doggies with our tail in back of us. And then when we only when we reach this point, then only can we begin to do good. That's one way pain can be used. And the second way in which it can be used is in reparation. And here we offer it up for others, not just for ourselves. How often, for example, in the physical order, doctors will graft skin. If we burn our face, from our back to our face, to restore our pristine elegance. If a person is suffering from anemia, doctors will transfuse blood from an anemic member of society to the, uh, the healthy member of society to the anemic person in order to cure the person of that condition. Now, if it's possible to transfuse blood, don't you think it's possible to transfuse prayer? possible to graft skin, it's not possible also to graft some reparation, some sacrifices. We live in a world in which we do not grow the sheep, for example, but we wear woolen clothes. Others help us. So it's possible to take our sorrows, our disappointments, and the jealousies and the hatreds of others and turn them all back again as the thief of the right did, in order that someone else might be saved. That's reparation. Why should we offer up our sufferings in expiation or reparation? Simply because we love. Love will not kill pain. But love will diminish it. A mother sits up with her sick child all night long. For it's not agony, it's love. There are not any lovers in the world, I mean real, true lovers, who would not willingly take on the pains and the agony of others, if they possibly could. Love in, in the face of sorrow does not seek isolation. It wants to take on that pain as its own. And why should not love in the face of sin and evil want to do the same thing? The great tragedy of our world is that most people have no one to love. And since there's no one to love, they never think of the love of God. Their life is tragic indeed. Oh, the tragedy of the world is not so much. Suffering is what we miss when we do suffer. Think of all of the sick in hospitals with aching brows who might in some way sanctify that pain by correlating it to a crown of thorns. And all the wounded hands that might sacramentalize that agony into they but correlate it in some way with hands that were riven with steel, to all the aching hearts of the world, with all of their worries and anxieties and fears, they would only not allow that pain to go to waste, but offer it up in union with someone whose heart was open to take in all the hearts of the world. Why should we fly from that love? I slipped his fingers. I escaped his feet. I ran in heaps. For him I feared to meet. 
One day I passed him, fettered on a tree. He turned his head and looked and beckoned me. Neither by speed nor strength could he prevail. Each hand and foot was pinioned by a nail. He could not run nor clasp me if he tried. With his eyes, he bade me reach a sight. For pity's sake, thought I, I'll set you free. Take this cross, said he, and follow me. This yoke is easy, this burden light, not hard nor grievous, if you wear it tight. And so did I follow him who could not move, an uncaught captive in the hand of love. There once was a time in our national history when there was only one traitor to our great country. Today, unfortunately, there are many. Next week, we shall speak on the psychology of traitors and 30 pieces of silver. Bye, and God love you. People of all faiths recognize Bishop Fulton J. Sheen as one of the greatest communicators of the 20th century. He was born in El Paso, Illinois, in May of 1896. As a young boy, he knew he wanted to be a priest. He served as an altar boy at St. Mary's Cathedral in Peoria, Illinois. At St. Viator College, his education and debating skills taught him the skills he used throughout his life. His unique ability at being natural and at ease in front of any audience was noted early in his ministry. He was ordained in 1919 and went on to become one of the best-known and greatly loved priests in church history. He wrote 96 books, and hundreds of articles and columns. He broadcast numerous radio and TV programs. People from all faiths watched him on television because he spoke to every man. They always waited with joy for his goodbye, his blessing, God love you. It continues to give us joy and memories. Bye now, and God love you. Bishop Fulton J. Sheen went to be with the Lord in December of 1979. Fulton J. Sheen, requiescat in pace.